I'm putting in here is going to reduce the tack of this ink. And then it's called Easy White. And this is called warming up the ink. You do this whether you're adding, you're modifying it or not. But you always warm up the ink to make it freer. So I make sure that the ink is thoroughly mixed. Sometimes it's just like when you're mixing a batter, the spoon holds on to some of the ingredients. But you want it evenly through. So this brand is Graphic Chemical. It's good for the type of copper plate etching I'm working with right now. I do other intaglio processes. One of them is mesotint. And I find that ink made by the Charbonnel company is much more um, suited to mesotint. And the inks are very different. This has a drying agent in it. It's called cobalt. And you, as a potter, would use cobalt as uh, to, to put blue onto pottery. In the beer making industry, they used to add cobalt to beer so that when you poured it, the, the foam head on the beer would stay longer. It wouldn't just disappear quickly. So, what I do is I put ink onto the plate, and then I have to work it deep into the grooves because when I etch a plate, the grooves are very deep compared to some people's etchings. So you work it into the plate, and that's the easy part. The hard part is taking it off because you have to take it off in stages. If you take the glue off, try and take it off, or the ink off, too uh, quickly, it pulls it out of the grooves. So the whole process that I'm going to do right now is to take the ink out bit by bit. So this is the first way I do it, is I get most of the excess ink, or a goodly portion of it, off the plate this way. And see, look, there's the first print, the ink off. So this newsprint, or it came from a telephone book, is uh, really sucks the ink off the plate. So it's good for taking the first bunch of ink off and, and other places. And as I work, I try and remove the ink from the plate every way I can. So where this paper was inky, I turn it over. Everything gets cleaner and cleaner. So the next thing I use is, this is called Tarleton, and it's like cheesecloth. Can you see through? And uh, it's uh, starched, so it makes these little, it's almost like a cheese grater for ink. It uh, cuts the ink off the plate. And that's what you want to do. You don't want to pull the ink off. You want to cut it off. And so this Tarleton, you make it, into a convex ball and then you can slowly cut the ink off the plate. And I try to wipe against the directions of the lines. I wipe across the lines if I can. So now you've got less ink on. And now I'm going to clean the back and the edges. I'm always reducing the amount of ink. So first I get the back, and then I get the edges. And I will always keep wiping the edges so that they end up being clean. Mm -hmm. So the first paper, I, I use the Tarleton, and then the first paper I'll use has got quite a bit of tooth to it. Mm -hmm. Just like this has a lot of tooth, this has tooth. And I will wipe and try and keep wiping across the lines. And I turn the paper so that every time I'm presenting a clean face to the plate, because 
If you don't, if you use a sticky part of the paper, it can pull the ink out of the lines. So again, okay. I'm wiping horizontally and trying to uh, cut the ink off the plate. So I'm going to look around and see that's pretty good. And then I, again, I do the edges. And that's 90% or more of the ink off this plate. This is very thin paper. Some people call it Bible paper. And uh, it's very thin. This is from uh, a Norton anthology of poetry that I accidentally, I thought I had three copies. So again, I'm taking as much ink off. Some artists like to leave this final layer of ink on, it's called, when it's printed, there are no real bright whites, uh, and, and they like to leave what they call plate tone. Uh, I don't. I like a very graphic image, so I try and reduce the ink on the surface of the plate to nothing so that the paper is white. Now this plate had a lot of flaws in it, and I had to scrape away marks that were unintended. And if you, if I tip, tip the plate, can you see that there are like little irregularities? Uh, those are where I scraped away marks that were not intended, and then I polished it. And so these are very smooth bowl-shaped depressions so that I can pull the ink off the plate there. And so you can see there were, I had to work on this plate a lot to get it to the point where I liked it. And again, the last thing I do is polish the plate edges. I have marked out where the plate goes and I have a line where the edge of the paper is supposed to go. That's why it's called a template. It's the template for me. Uh, at registering the plate. So I'm going to go like that. I'm going to take my gloves off and I'm going to get the paper. How etching works is that when paper is made of many fibers together and once it's dried, the fibers are very tight. And when you wet it, the fibers relax and the paper swells and it becomes soft. And that allows it to be driven into the grooves in the plate and pull the ink out. So this is, I'm just taking the shine off this paper and uh, just taking the excess white wet off the surface. When it comes out the other side of the press, for some reason or other, it's almost dry. So I always mark the back of every piece of paper so I know which is the softest part. And I line up my paper. Sometimes, if it's a very bold etch, uh, I can put paper on top, and that preserves the blanket. From, paper has sizing in it, which makes it harder, right? Some papers, like watercolor papers, have much more sizing in it than printmaking papers do. But still, printmaking papers help do have sizing most of the time. So, I put a little piece of newsprint on to catch the sizing, because it's very soft paper that I use. It's very responsive. It, it registers every mark, every speck of ink on the plate. So I can put this on it. But if I was doing a, a more gentle etch, I would not have this on because it would be like having cardboard on top of the print. And the paper would not be driven down if I was using a, like a Japanese paper and a very, um, not a very shallow etch. So there are three blankets. There's only one that really does the job. The bottom blanket's called the soaker or the sizing catcher. This is a felted blanket. There are others that are woven and its only job is to catch the sizing. The middle blanket is called the cushion. This is the blanket that does all the work. It's soft and with the pressure of the press, it's able to push the paper deep into the grooves. 
The top blanket is called the pusher. This blanket is so soft, the cushion is so soft, that if I did not have the pusher on it, running it through the press repeatedly would spread it out like pizza dough. It would stretch. Okay. This blanket, which is woven and fairly thick, takes that lateral pressure and absorbs it, allowing just the edge of this roller, and it's very narrow, to exert pressure on the cushion and drive it into the plate. So this, that's the why we, I use three blankets. This press can be used by 95-year-old artists because it's very easy. That press over there takes a lot more pressure, takes a lot more energy to turn. Although that big wheel does help. So we just run it through. And you try and run it through at an easy rate. And you don't stop because if you stop anywhere, it may have the plate underneath there and it would create a line. This press is a Praga press. It was made in Scarborough, Ontario, and I believe that it was, uh, that it was one of the few etching presses, uh, you know, made, manufactured in Canada. And it was done by the family. And that it was only in the last 20 years that the Praga family um, stopped making the press and stopped selling uh, printmaking equipment. So as you can see, this is called the emboss. And this is one way you know that your pressure is right, is that, that you see a good emboss uh, in the paper, right? And so what you do is you hold it because you don't want it to move because the, the print, the plate is sucked right into the paper and so you want to slowly release it and then there you have a print.